my presentation today is called Spit an Image. And, and I want to show a couple of things to, to explain why it's called that. And uh, first of all, you know what apostrophes do, right? You know how they work? Apostrophes take the place of a letter. And I'll show you like with this illustration, we say he is not hungry. If we move not over and we take the O out and we put an apostrophe in that takes the place of the O, then we have he isn't hungry. And let's look at this phrase, bread and butter. If you say, um, boy, this morning I'd like some bread and butter. Generally, we don't say it that way. We say, I would like some bread and butter. Right? It's just the way the language works. We kind of tend to shorten and contractualize things. The spit and image, and the reason this works for this particular presentation is that it has to do with the scripture that was read. Spit, well, it's not really a, maybe we should call it saliva, but it is spit after all. Spit really represents the substance. When we talk about a, a young man, for example, who looks just like his dad, he has the spit of his dad, that is the substance of his father. The spit, you know, is what we're made of, part of what we're made of. And the image, well, generally that young man has the appearance of his father and probably his behavior as well. So when we say a person is the spit and image of his father, we're really saying he's the substance and he's the image. He's the appearance of his father. And we can shorten that spit and image to spit and image. See, a lot of people think that the saying is spitting image. That's not correct. First of all, A, images don't spit. And it really, it is spit and image shortened down. And that doesn't work. Neither does spitting image, because all that is really is a short version of spitting image. Now, what I'm going to be reading uh, to you and with you this morning comes primarily from the book of John, chapter 9. And I know everyone is familiar with this story. Uh, so follow along with me, if you will, if you can read it on the screen or if you want to open your scriptures and read along there. It says, the scripture says, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now that's important. The man was born blind. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? By the way, that's what disciples called Jesus. They called him Rabbi. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, I think it's interesting that oftentimes people think that they have an affliction because they've been bad. They've done something wrong. But this scripture says, at least in this case, and I think in many cases, oftentimes people's afflictions are there to reveal the presence of God, to reveal God in some way. And that's what happened in this case. Remember that he's blind from birth. This is very important. And Jesus, when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay, actually mud really, when you think about it, with the saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, Seems kind of an odd way to heal, doesn't it? Spit on the ground, mix it up with a little dirt, put it on the man's eyes. Consider this. Man is essentially mud. Really, we are. Uh, why mud? Well, they say that the human body is 75% water. If you'll notice, I don't know if you can see it on that screen, but the brain actually is 80.5% water. I'll bet David Allen knows all about this stuff. How much are we water, David? A lot of water. 
I like this little illustration. It says, if the human body is 75% water, how can I be 35% body fat? <laughs> it's a good question. Do the math. It doesn't add up. So the rest of our body, if a lot of our body is water, the rest of our body is essentially dirt. After all, Genesis 2.7 says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, that's the dirt of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, some scriptures say a living soul. Water plus dirt equals mud. So we're essentially mud. Now that's not to denigrate us. God does a lot of good things with mud. Jesus used the elements of the human body, in the case of the blind man, to heal the human body. He used mud. But why did he use spit instead of clean, pure water? Doesn't that seem kind of strange to you? Why did Jesus use his spit? There was water nearby. Actually, the man was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam. So there was water nearby. It wasn't as if Jesus didn't have any water. So why did he use spit? Well, spit's different from water. First of all, spit contains what we call deoxyribonucleic acid, commonly known as DNA. That's very different from plain water. Deoxyribonucleic acid is a molecule that carries most of the genetic instructions used in the development, functioning, and reproduction of all known living organisms and many viruses. And that's the Wikipedia uh, definition of it. And you know, when oftentimes when they take a sample of a person's uh, DNA, they do it by swabbing the mouth with a swab. That spit in there. That's what that is. So that they get the DNA from the spit. Now, I don't know if you've had your mouth swabbed. Um, if you've been swabbed for COVID, it's probably been in the nose, um, which is usually very uncomfortable. The first time I had my nose swabbed, I thought they were going to stick it right in my brain. Um, they've actually improved on it now, so it doesn't go quite so far in. Now, Jesus anointed the man, blind man's eyes with his own spit, his own DNA, and a little dirt. All humans, including Jesus, are part of the same gene pool. We're all part of the same gene pool. Well, there are variations in markers. You know, male has the Y chromosome, female has the X chromosome. So there are some variations, but we're really all part of the same pool. And he, that's Jesus, said to him, the blind man, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. Jesus is saying, essentially, you have my genetic physical structure. You've already got it. You're part of my DNA. We're all part of the same DNA, as it were. You know, they found out recently that they can even tell eye color and skin color and many other characteristics from our DNA. So they've actually identified criminals before they ever saw them. When they have their DNA, they can tell what they look like. Pretty impressive. You have my genetic structure, but you must take on my image as well. Image, character. In other words, we must be washed clean of our own sinful image so we can begin to take on Jesus' image. Is that right? I mean, we don't want... Uh, I like this scripture, and it kind of applies... We don't want to take on Jesus' image and still retain our old sinful image. Am I right or wrong? This scripture says, neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. We won't put that new image into our old image. If they do, the skins will burst. 
The wine will run out. That's because new wine expands. And it bursts those old, fragile skins. And the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. Matthew 9, 16 and 17. So he, the blind man, went and washed and came back seeing John 9, 7. I want you to notice something that he didn't come back seeing until he had washed. He didn't have any perception until he had washed in the pool of Siloam. Therefore, continuing on in John 8, 9 rather, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind, by the way, I often wondered, how did he get to the pool of Siloam if he couldn't see yet? Well, it, his friends took him, obviously. But he, he came back, and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? See, they all knew him. I mean, in these towns, in the old times, everybody knew the local lame people and the blind people and the deaf people. Everybody knew who they were. Some said, This is he. Others said, Well, he, he's like him. You know, he looks like him. But he said, I, I am he. That's me. I'm the same. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and I received sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now, it was Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Now, why do you suppose Jesus often healed on the Sabbath? Why do you suppose he did that? He did it with the lame man at the pool of Bethesda. And he healed him right on the Sabbath day. Let me ask you something. Is it good to do good on the Sabbath? If your neighbor is, is out of food... And it's the Sabbath day. Are you wrong to go buy that neighbor some food? You're not wrong. It's good to do good on the Sabbath. Now, I wouldn't make my normal practice to go to fries and shop on the Sabbath. See, that's what the commandment really means. Don't do your normal activities on the Sabbath. It's a special day. But if you're helping people, that's very different. And so Jesus also wanted to show the Pharisees that not only could he heal, but he also always, almost always told the person, your sins are forgiven. And that was controversial, wasn't it? Because who can forgive sins except God? So Jesus had his reasons for healing on the Sabbath, and then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. Because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. See? Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, and I like this, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, well, he's a prophet. Now, a prophet in the old days was not always a person who told the future. A prophet was a teacher, oftentimes. And so this man considered him a teacher. Probably didn't know about his ability to prophesy. But the Jews didn't believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. Can't happen. Can't be true. Until they called his parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He'll speak for himself. Now, his parents said that because they feared the Jews. You know, the Jews had agreed already that if anybody confessed that Jesus was the Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. 
And that was major. That was like being excommunicated back then. So therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. We don't want to attest to this. Ask the blind man. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I, I don't know. One thing I do know, he says, that though I was blind, now I see. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I, I, I told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? And I love this next part. Do you also want to become his disciples? Oh, that, oh, that tore them up. That, that tore these Pharisees up. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. I love in the, the video series, The Chosen. Anybody been watching The Chosen? They accused Jesus of not following the law of Moses. And Jesus said, I am the law of Moses. I am the law of Moses. So they don't really even know that by following the law of Moses, they really ought to or should be following Jesus. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he's from, yet he's opened my eyes. Now we know that God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins. Don't you think they were too? And you're teaching us? Twelve-year-old Jesus taught them in the temple, and they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And what did Jesus do? It says, when he had found him. So Jesus went looking for the blind man. Did you notice that in the scriptures? And when he'd found him, he said to him, do you believe in the son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see. And that those who see may be made blind. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, are we blind also? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. See, when we claim to see truth and we don't really see it, we're blind. See, when we claim things that we don't really know or see. We talked uh, this morning in Sabbath school about integrity. Integrity is working in accordance with your conscience, working to do what you believe in. If you work to do something you don't believe in, then you're a hypocrite, aren't you? I don't mean you personally. The blind man now had the spit of Jesus, <laughs> and now he would begin to take on his image. After all, he accepted him as God, didn't he? And worshiped him. He would then be the spit and image of Jesus. You and I, and really all mankind, already have the spit of Jesus. Did you know that? The genealogy? Now what we all really need is the image. So what does the image of Jesus look like? Well, I can't portray everything that it looks like, but let me 
let me show some things that I researched and I think really exemplify what Jesus looks like. I don't mean physically. Well, first of all, in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, he says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Meek and lowly. There's two things that he is. Are we meek? What does meek really mean? A lot of people think it means wimpy. That's not what it means at all. It means teachable. That's what it means. Weak does not mean weak. Not equal. Are we lowly? Lowly is humble. And as it says in Corinthians, not puffed up. Are we lowly? Are we humble and not puffed up? I dare say I'm not always that way. Sometimes, you know, I, I know something and I want to assert that I know it. I want to make it clear that I know something. And sometimes I do it in a not lowly way. Ever fall into that? You don't have to answer. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't respect people. You know that. It means that he's, he's not partial. He considers everyone in his love. Now, does God love some people more than others? I don't know. Bible says that John is the beloved disciple. Do you love somebody more than you love other people? Del, do you love Laura more than you love, I don't know, Rodney? I mean, it, that's the way life is. I mean, I'm sure you love Rodney. Uh, we love each other, right? But I love my wife more than I love anybody else on earth. So yes, I believe God can, can love somebody more in the sense that he's closer to them. I don't think that he actually loves one and doesn't love another. So no partiality. Are we impartial? Do you treat other people, maybe people of other ethnic groups, the same as you treat your own ethnic group? See, now, I don't like to use the word race because Asian people are not another race. They're part of the human race. Black people are not another race. In fact, the Bible never talks about the word race in describing the ethnic of people, the ethnic group of people. The only time that God uses or the Bible uses the word race is the race that we're all supposed to run and win. Otherwise, the Bible refers to nations and tongues and peoples. We're not a different race, guys. Are we impartial with other people? Are you just as okay with an Asian man working on your car as you are with a white guy? With an Anglo? Do you even think about people of another ethnic group as inferior in some way? I hope not. But sometimes it's hard because of the, how we've been nurtured. You know, I was born in the deep south, okay? And black people had a different cultural status, shall we say, in the south and still do. But I was not trained to hate black people or to think of them as inferior. They were different but my family was very loving towards black. I was fortunate in that respect that my family was loving towards black people. But a lot of Southerners certainly weren't and still aren't. So are we impartial? Should we be impartial? Is there any percentage in thinking of someone else as inferior to us because of skin color? 
or where they come from. You know, the Bible says mankind is all of one blood. All of one blood. That's why that black man can, if he has the same type of blood as you, he can donate blood to you and save your life. We're all of one blood. Now, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Do we condemn? Now, it's a rhetorical question in a way. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and say, yes, I condemned my neighbor yesterday. But yeah, I think we do. I think sometimes we look at some other person and condemn them in our hearts. We may not say it, but we may feel it. And if Christ doesn't condemn us, should we condemn others? Don't we want to be Christ-like? Don't we want to be like Jesus? You know, brothers and sisters, it's not easy to be like Jesus. It's not an easy task. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Forgiveness. Do we forgive? Is there any, you don't have to raise your hand, anybody still harboring resentment against someone for something they did against them? Now, we can't forgive people's sins for God. Only God can forgive those sins. But we can forgive people's trespasses against us, their sins against us, if you will. But do we forgive? Do we really forgive when we say, oh, I forgive you? But in our heart of hearts, are we still harboring something of unforgiveness? Again, it's a rhetorical question. We have a long way to go to be like Jesus, in my estimation. Is it an impossible task? No. If it were, if it were impossible, God wouldn't ask us to do it. But he says, learn of me. Jesus says, learn of me. You want to be like me. Do you want to be like Jesus? <laughs> Boy, do I ever. And do I ever fall short. But every day, every day, I, I, I approach the throne and I say, Lord, let me be like you. More and more like you. And he became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross, the Bible says, which was one of the worst forms of death ever invented by mankind. Are we obedient unto death? It may come to that, you know. I hear there are people, of course you hear all kinds of things, but I hear there are people that in their effort to try to eliminate crime and all that kind of thing, they're even thinking about bringing back public hangings and things like that. And maybe the guillotine. I think I'd rather die by the guillotine than being hanged. They say it's relatively painless. Of course, once you've had the guillotine, how can you attest to that? <laughs> oh, yeah, it wasn't that painful. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, being obedient unto death, wow. That's heavy, isn't it? We think about it uh, because, and we probably say, yeah, I would be obedient unto death. But what if you're really faced with the death? What if you're in prison like John the Baptist was? and you are threatened with being beheaded. You know all the Christians that have been beheaded over in the Middle East for their faith? And many of them went willingly. I know at least one person said, Jesus, help me, as he was being beheaded.
What's the image of Jesus look like? Well, everything that we've mentioned and so much more. Jesus' image is vast. It's so encompassing that we really don't have, that's why I said I, I can't really portray everything. Um, I just mentioned a few things, but his, his righteousness, his love, his kindness, his care is so much greater than we know. Are we willing to become the spitting image of Jesus? Do we want his genealogy? Well, we already have that. Do we want his image? I want to be the spitting image of Jesus, don't you? I'm going to leave you with this phrase. It's a Latin phrase. Uh, looks like it actually could come from the Proverbs. It doesn't. It comes from a Roman poet named Virgil. Virgilius. Omnia vincent amor. Anybody seen that phrase before? Omnia means all or everything. Vincent means conquered. Amor means love. Love conquers all. Love conquers all. If we have no other thing, let us have the love of Christ. Because love conquers all. And I want to have that kind of love, don't you? If you want to be the spitting image of Jesus and have a love that conquers all, would you stand with me right now? Heavenly Father, we want to be like you. We want to have your image in every sense. And only you can provide the strength and the ability to have that image. Only you can provide the desire to have that image. And I just wonder, what do we need to give up in this old wineskin that we inhabit to have the new wine that is your love and your righteousness? I ask, Lord, that you provide the means that we may be like Jesus every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. And I ask that for everyone here in the sound of, within the sound of my voice. And Lord, I ask it especially for me. I feel as Paul did, I, I feel like the chief of sinners oftentimes. But I know that your forgiveness is there. If we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. No, from all unrighteousness. Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, the only wise, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.